Silicon Flatirons is a research center at Colorado Law School. We work with students to give them the tools they need to pursue careers in tech, law, policy, and entrepreneurship. When I started, Silicon Flatirons was an experiment. It was me and some students putting on a few conferences without really a plan where it was gonna go. My initial motivation was because I didn't believe you could have impactful policy discussions unless you brought people together across different disciplines. Silicon Flatiron Center has given me an image of what a team can look like. And it really made Boulder into a location that was seen as on par with DC or Silicon Valley and other places around the country that are leading thought centers in the field of law and tech. What's excited me uh, the most is to see it grow, but not only just grow in terms of the number of people attending our different events, but growing in terms of the different areas that we have been involved in. When a law student says, I've got a passion for understanding the intersection of technology and law, but where do I get started with that? What Flatirons provides is a position to actually go angle for a job during their second summer, where they're actually gonna to get to be involved directly in setting tech policy or in advocating around tech policy. The Silicon Flatirons community is incredibly unique in how close it is and how people are willing to band together to move conversations forward. It's one thing to be sitting in a room by yourself reading articles, and it's very much another thing to actually be sitting at a table talking to somebody about their daily experiences of trying to navigate compliance with a complex new law. We're all a community of uh, friends who enjoy spending time with one another. The people we engage with through here are very much thinkers and thought leaders, so they're contributing to whether it's our strategy or our resources in really meaningful ways. Uh, Silicon Flatirons has changed the dynamic between Colorado law and the surrounding community as well as the national community. One of the great joys of my profession is talking to people who are really early in their careers and helping them get excited about what you're excited about. We get the types of people in the room that everyone thinks should be talking to one another, but often are not. I get to work with students, I get to work with attorneys, I get to work with policymakers at the intersection of all these issues. Students are first and foremost, so uh, everything is generally student-driven. And it is centered around people who are wanting to engage with students. I've seen students uh, come into Silicon Flatirons just having a little interest in it, you know, in year one, and by year three, uh, they're passionate about it and they found their career. And I think that that really helps the um, standing of the university more broadly, and it also attracts lots of really interesting and talented speakers. I think what I'm excited to see happen with Silicon Flatirons in the next five, 10, even 20 years is for it to blend continuity with change. It's not enough to have smaller conversations anymore. The world is all connected, and Silicon Flatirons is going to reflect that global nature of the internet as we move forward into 20 years in the future. I hope it continues to operate with the same spirit of experimentation, of adventure, of seeking out new challenges that we've done over the first 20 years. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Amy Stepanovich, and I'm the Executive Director of Silicon Flatirons, and I'm so honored to be able to welcome you here with us today virtually. I can't wait till we can be back together in the same room, when I can connect with you one-on-one -on -one and hear more about what you're thinking about or what you're working on. It's been a great inspiration to me to see that sense of shared community that's present at every one of our events that I attend. And I'm so glad we can continue in that tradition, even when we're not together. If this is your first Silicon Flatirons event, I welcome you. Silicon Flatirons has a mission to elevate the debate around technology law, policy, and entrepreneurship, to spark tomorrow's conversations through intellectually honest programming and community engagement. I wanna thank our staff, our speakers, and our full community for helping to inspire and execute the programming that you're going to see here today. And a special thank you to our supporters. It was so important to us to be able to provide the programming you're about to see free of charge so that it could be accessible by anyone, regardless of any hardship they may be facing. We're so appreciative of our supporters' generosity so we can continue to serve our full community. If you enjoy today's program 
and you want to help us create more like it. And if you have the means, we would welcome a donation to Silicon Flatirons today. Every dollar you make has a long and lasting impact. And if you'd like to help us, you can go to siliconflatirons.org and click on the donate button. Thank you again so much for joining us, and I hope you enjoy today's program. Before we get going, um, I think we've got the names squared away now in the Zoom room. Um, Amy, you want to just give a, a one-liner, and I will defer to our online write-ups uh, of the speaker's deeper bios. But Amy, where are you coming from? Um, I'm coming from Sunshine Canyon in Boulder, Colorado, uh, where I have my own employment law practice um, counseling uh, employers on navigating employment law issues. Amy, great to have you with us, and your connectivity looks pretty good from Sunshine Canyon, Canyon today. <laughs> uh, Brett, why don't you introduce yourself next, please. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, Brett Painter. I'm with Davis Graham and Stubbs. Uh, my office office is in Denver. My home office is in Westminster, Colorado. Right. Great to have you with us. And Carolyn? Yeah, I'm Carolyn Rashby, and I'm an employment lawyer who has a, essentially a counseling practice. I've been practicing for a long time, and my office office is San Francisco, and home office is Oakland, California. Thank you. Thanks to each of you for joining us. Um, for those of you who are tuning in, I, I think we're in for a really uh, stimulating and informative discussion. The prep call revealed the, the depth of expertise on this panel is really excellent. Uh, we'll do those first three uh, parts that I outlined at the outset in about 45 minutes, uh, and then we'll reserve the last 10 or 15 minutes for Q&A. If you have questions along the way, please feel free to put them into the chat window, and, uh, and we will take them as we get them. Finally, I want a plus one, uh, Amy Stepanovich's thanks to Silicon Flatirons and supporters. Thank you for making these kind of conversations possible, as well as the Silicon Flatirons team uh, that behind the scenes makes this easy for, for myself and others to, uh, to provide, I think, worthwhile discussion. Uh, with that, I want to um, turn things over to Amy Hartman, who is going to tee up a framing discussion surrounding some of the issues as we look at returning to the workplace. Amy? Hi, nice to meet everybody this afternoon. So this is going to be pretty rapid fire. There is a lot of ground for the three of us to cover in the hour that we have together and want to make sure that we leave a lot of time for questions. But, um, you know, basically, as we start returning to work, um, there's a lot of conversation around sort of telecommuting and telecommuting forever. But really what we're going to focus on today are those workplaces where, you know, sort of the telecommute forever is not uh, realistic. We have um, sort of retail service industry, manufacturing, a whole host of, of companies and industries where we are getting people back into the workplace. Some of you um, have already been up and running because you are in an essential function or you have clients that are in an essential function. So they've been doing this throughout the, the pandemic. Um, there are sort of two different aspects to return to work. One is the more physical um, requirements and, and the obligations. And those Brett uh, and Carolyn are going to talk to uh, further on down the program. And in, in terms of the legal landscape, the, the return to work and sort of the, the physical and, and how we return to work and what that looks like, that's being led at mostly the state and local level. So the CDC, Center for Disease Control and the federal, they, they've given us sort, sort of guidelines on what things should look like, but each state and each local municipality is really giving us sort of the framework as to social distancing and sort of what the workplace needs to look like. The opposite is sort of true uh, with regard to the, the human aspect or the human element uh, with regard to returning employees to the workplace. That is actually led um, more by the federal government and sort of what I call um, the alphabet soup, if you will, of um, legislation and laws and just sort of throwing out a couple of uh, buzzwords. So we've got um, the new CARES Act and we've got the leave requirements that are in the new, new CARES Act. So that is at the federal level. We've got the Americans with Disabilities Act and how we treat employees who may have a disability or we may perceive as having a disability in bringing them back to work. So the Americans with Disabilities Act, again, federal. We have the Department of Labor and issues around wage and hour, which Carolyn's gonna talk about, which is again, federal, which is supplemented 
by the different states. So it's so when we come to the employees and the human aspect of it, we've got more of a, a federal bent, uh, and then we follow up with the states as opposed to sort of the physical aspects of returning people to work. So the first thing is, you know, who's going to kind of marshal all the troops and figure this all out. And, and the first thing I think everybody on the panel um, it would strongly suggest is that you have either a return to work coordinator or a return to work task force that's responsible for sort of keeping themselves and the employer up to date on all of these issues. Um, I recommend a very small task force and an oddly numbered task force. So one, three, five, you know, people. Why is that? So that when you have to vote on issues, uh, you don't get stuck uh, with, with a sort of a tie. So um, odd numbers, uh, one, three, five, always great. And um, these people, um, should be either given a bonus or some sort of hazard pay because keeping track, as Caroline and Brett and I talked about yesterday, keeping track on literally almost an hourly basis of what is changing with regard to return to work um, can be a full-time job. Uh, and so you really, if you're, if you're tasking people with that, just you know, keep in mind that it is a lot of work. Um, as we bring people back to work, the real issue is focusing on the positions that we need to bring back into the workplace rather than the people. So I always start with um, what positions do we need to have in the workplace, not who do we need to have. If we start with that framework, we'll get, we'll, we'll get the right people back to work and the people that we need back to work. And then we'll deal with the issue of who we bring back. So first it is the positions that we need to have physically uh, in the workplace. And then second is, okay, who are we going to bring back? And, and I think that the employees fall into um, sort of four broad categories. Um, and the first are those employees that are willing, ready, and able to come back to work and they're, you know, they're volunteering, they're ready to go. And some employers may think, hey, that's great. I, I'm just going to fill all of my um, positions with those people who are volunteering. Uh, and if I need to retrain them, I will do that. Well, I would say not so fast on that. So, so even if we have people who are volunteering, um, we want to make sure that we have the right people and the people that we need. So it's great that we've got that group and we're just going to kind of hold them to the side. Um, the second is the people that we need to come back to work um, that, that either have a generalized fear of coming back, they don't have any medical or health issues that we're aware of, um, but they've expressed that they're just having an, you know, anxiety or they don't want to come back to work because they're collecting uh, unemployment at, at a rate that exceeds their, their pay. Uh, and so they just would rather sit on the sidelines, but we need to, them to come back. So we need to come up with some strategies around communicating the need for those people to come back into the workplace, why their position is not um, conducive to continued telecommuting or working from home and getting those people back to work. Uh, the third category is uh, uh, those people that fall into a high risk category. Um, and the CDC has identified a number of high risk categories, whether it's somebody who's over the age of 65, uh, has pulmonary issues, has other health issues. And those people are at, you know, are a higher risk. And what we see with a lot of employers is a tendency to be paternalistic. So I'm going to make the decision for those employees that either I know to be of high risk or that I perceive to be at high risk. And I'm either going to tell them not to come to work or I'm going to prevent them from coming to work because I'm concerned as the employer about what might happen. That is an issue that really raises concerns under the Americans with Disabilities Act. And, and we, I think everyone on the panel has concerns about sort of taking that paternalistic approach. I'm going to tell you, high risk person, that you can't come back to work. The better way to handle that is to do a questionnaire type scenario where we're asking everybody, hey, here are the high risk categories. If you fall into one of these categories and you feel that you are concerned about coming back to work, then there may be an accommodation available for you. But having that communication come from the high-risk employee to us rather than from the employer to the high-risk employee, let, letting them self-identify. 
And then of course, there's the fourth category. There are people who cannot come back to work at this time because they either have COVID, uh, they have been exposed to it, they have childcare issues that may allow them to have a leave of absence. So they are basically covered under COVID. And for those people, um, we wanna engage engage in an interactive process and be aware of what our um, legal obligations are and their rights and responsibilities are. So those are the four categories and sort of how we treat them is we want to start out with um, treating everybody, even those, you know, volunteers, people who look, you know, healthy and ready to come back to work. We want to give everybody the same level of information. Um, I recommend a return to work memo that sort of outlines the positions that we need to come back into the workplace um, and how we're going to bring people back in safely, which Brett is going to talk about. Um, and then a medical questionnaire, which is not really a, a questionnaire about what symptoms they have, but here are the high risk categories. Here uh, are the accommodations that might be um, necessary or available. You tell us if you think that you can't come back to work and then we'll work on that on an individualized basis. So that's sort of the, the, the framework to start out with. Amy, that's super helpful. Maybe I'll turn to Brett first. I'd like to stay with that framework and uh, just to reiterate the, the four categories of workers that, that Amy identified. First is the enthusiastic employer, at least the willing employee to come back. Second, the reluctant returner, either out of fear or for another reason that they're reluctant to come back. Third is uh, someone who's a high risk, uh, who falls into a high risk category, a vulnerable individual. And fourth, someone who cannot come back because they're either ill or family obligations. Um, Brett, uh, does, does those four categories make sense to you? And uh, if so, with respect to the first, the volunteer employee who's, who's willing and or eager to come back, any cautions that you have for that first category? Yeah, so I think those are the four categories that, um, you know, we, we are sort of dealing with as we try to reintegrate um, into the workplace. Um, the, you know, the reality is that, as Amy indicated, there is sort of latent liability with respect to each one of those categories under these different statutes. It can be, um, you know, an age issue. It can be a health issue that might qualify as a disability that you have to need, that you need to think about accommodating. Um, and so the person who is willing to come back into the workplace and wants to get back to work um, might fall within one of these different protected characteristics that you also need to be thinking of. Um, and as Amy indicated, there is sort of a knee-jerk reaction as an example of somebody who might be over the age of 65 to say, no, we're going to protect you um, from potential risks in the workplace. Um, and try to make a decision for that individual, which, which obviously uh, you know, it can create an issue because you're making a decision based on age. And so, you know, with respect to those individuals who wants to come back, um, regardless of the different types of liability, what an employer is faced with at the end of the day is the question of how do I do this safely? Um, how do I get those individuals who do want to come back into the workforce um, back safely? And what's my exposure to the extent that I bring somebody back um, and for whatever reason, the, the safety net that we put into place doesn't work and somebody is infected and they infect coworkers. Probably the most common question that I'm getting right now is, what's my liability as an employer um, if somebody contracts COVID-19 at work? The good news is um, that uh, there's a, a insurance payment that you make every month as an employer, your workers' uh, compensation insurance that really covers workplace injuries. And, and it, it is broadly defined to include anything that arises from or relates to the workplace. Um, and the great thing about your workers' compensation insurance is that the workers' compensation statutes in almost every state provide that it's the exclusive remedy. It's the only remedy that an employee has um, if they suffer a workplace injury. Um, and, and contracting COVID-19, although there's a lot of um, commentary and speculation about whether or not that falls within the classification of a workplace injury, it does arise or relate to the workplace. And so assuming that you can show that's where somebody contracted it, um, that employee has the only remedy that, that, they can, um, that they can seek is through the workers' comp process. And so 
you know, essentially that kind of gets quantified into an amount of money. They get medical uh, bills paid depending on the nature and, uh, of the symptoms and the effects. There might be additional money. What they can't do is file a lawsuit um, alleging negligence or some type of premises liability because the statute prevents those types of actions um, by, by making the only remedy the workers' comp remedy. So uh, the, the issue for employers recognizing that that provides some comfort from exposure is maintaining that workers' comp coverage. It can be lost. There are certain situations where you know, if an if a employer was sort of cavalier or reckless and didn't uh, implement any type of um, safety measures for people's return to the workplace, they might lose or compromise that, that exclusive remedy provision in, in the workers' comp code. So it's important for employers to be thinking about um, the logistics of how they're going to be bringing people back. And I think it falls kind of in two categories. Uh, one is sort of employee centric, um, uh, an employee centric focus and an employer centric focus. And what I mean by that, employee centric is things like health screening. Um, you know, Amy referenced before somebody's walking in the door, making sure that they're asymptomatic and that you have a good process in place every single day um, to make sure that you don't have somebody who's coming in who's either been infected or exposed. Um, other things that are employee centric is things like PPE or protective equipment that an employee um, would be expected to wear. I think now it's, it's pretty well known that you don't go anywhere um, without a mask um, or you shouldn't. And an employer requiring employees to wear masks in the workplace, at least when they're going to come into contact with other employees, maybe not if you're in a closed office, but to the extent that you're going to be in relative close proximity with, with regard to others, making sure people are wearing masks, making sure hand sanitizer is available. Um, if gloves uh, are appropriate, making sure that those are available. These are all things that employers want to provide. It's not a burden you should shift on to employees. Um, but, um, you know, ways that you can keep employees safe. And, and they also need some training on things like distancing and making sure that they understand what the rules are on distancing and how they're supposed to conduct themselves in the workplace. So that, that's really the employee focus and what you're trying to do, um, you know, with respect to all things employee to prevent um, exposure with, with regard to other employees. There's also sort of an employer centric portion of this, which is how are you maintaining your facilities and what are you doing inside the workplace to make sure that um, you're keeping people safe. Regular cleaning, more regular cleaning than you typically or normally would do um, is at the top of the list in terms of expectations that employers have. You know, you've got to make sure that high contact areas are being wiped down regularly, um, making sure that surfaces um, that, that people would have access to are being wiped down regularly. Um, most people are really upping their, most companies are upping their cleaning much more regularly than it might have been done in the past. Um, and so that's a huge focus for the employer. Another thing is to maintain the social distancing, you know, what are you doing from a configuration standpoint? Um, have you, where there's common areas like lunchrooms, break rooms, have you taken steps to either close those off or um, taken steps to make sure to the extent that they're gonna be open that people are able to maintain um, social distancing and physical distancing not having four chairs around a table instead of having one, you know, having one chair around a table. Um, trying to think through those things that will help protect employees from themselves um, because we are social creatures and we do like to talk to one another. We're used to being around each other. That's kind of the whole purpose of the break room. You have to actively try to make sure that um, you're taking steps to prevent employees from coming in close contact. To the extent you know you have partitions um, in certain industries, we, we've seen the the barriers, sort of the sneeze guards that are being put up in retail and other um, and other businesses such as that. Those are all things that employers need to think through and steps they need to take to make sure that they're keeping people um, safe. Um, travel it within the within the the company within the hallways, ingress, egress. Um, you know whether or not you have a one-way traffic flow so that people aren't walking by each other. Um, all of these types of things are pretty readily available, you know, in terms of um, information online, in terms of what you can do in the workplace. Um, the reason why you want to do this is to take steps to make sure that you're being reasonable under the statute, that you're thinking about it. Um, if 
by some chance the workers' compensation defense wouldn't be available to you, what you're going to be left with is negligence law. And that's kind of how a reasonable person acts under the circumstances, how a reasonable company acts. And if you can list off a ton of things that you've done or that you um, implemented to, to not only help employ, make sure employees weren't coming in who were sick, but also um, making sure that you tamp that down to the extent somebody got through the front door, that's going to be your best medicine from a liability standpoint in protecting yourself. Uh, super helpful. Thank you, Brett. And um, I, your comments raise um, in turn a lot of questions about, uh, especially with respect to the employee centric uh, safety measures, uh, what sort of privacy considerations are there going to be, confidentiality considerations, especially to the extent that there's health uh, information that is collected. Before we go there, though, I want to circle back on a couple of things that Amy and Brett have teed up. And Carolyn, maybe I'll turn to you first. Um, let's go to the reluctant returner, the employee who um, has concerns about the, the dangers of the virus and just does not want to come back. How do you advise companies when considering the reluctant returner? That's only our first. We <laughs> so that's, um, we're doing pretty well. <laughs> uh, someone had to do it. Um, <laughs> I think the you know, the place to start is to talk to the employee are based on, um, not to assume that you as the employer, um, you know, know that the employees may be being irrational or that you've done everything that you need to do, but to really delve into that a little bit, find out what the fears are. And, um, you know, from there, really think about, you know, is the employee raising something that as the employer you need to address? Um, do you need to, for example, um, you, you know, is the employee raising a particular safety issue that needs to be addressed? Um, is the employee, does the employee maybe have a medical issue um, that hasn't come to light yet? And that is, you know, their fear is, is partially based upon that. Um, is there, you know, an issue with the commuting? Um, a lot of us have, you know, been, I'm sure, uh, fielding questions from um, companies about, you know, how do you get people to work in urban areas? And that's a real uh, fear that a lot of people have is going on public transit. So are there ways that you can uh, work with that? And then just another consideration is um, National Labor Relations Act. You know, is the employee uh, raising a, a, a concern um, perhaps on behalf of other uh, individuals in the workplace, and um, you might need to approach that with some caution too. So, lots of issues. That's super helpful. Don't just Maybe open up. That hand. Let me open up to the panel um, in terms of the high risk category. Amy, you said that it's helpful to send out a medical questionnaire potentially. One strategy is send out a medical questionnaire. Um, as well as perhaps alert employees that if they fall into one of these categories, they may want to raise their hand to express reservations about coming back. Um, what are the bright line categories here of this is clearly going to be a protected employee and if he or she does not want to come back to the workplace, fine. And where are the hard calls going to be in terms of uh, not a, a clearly protected category, and how do you counsel an employer under those circumstances? Amy, do you want to go first? Well, I just I, I will go first just to to clarify because I think I was a little bit imprecise and want to make sure for um, for those listeners on the call that there's there's two different things and what I'm suggesting and I and again this is this is my bad. Um, when we talk about sending out information to employees before they come back to work, um, my suggestion is, is not necessarily really a medical questionnaire along the lines that you would think of in sort of the interactive process under the Americans with Disabilities Act. It actually is more of here are the high risk categories that the CDC has identified. If you fall into one of these categories, you know, there may be an issue with returning to work. You, we may be, you know, having an obligation to accommodate you. So sort of the raise your hand, but it's not asking people about their symptoms. That's separate. And that is the, the, the medical questionnaire. That's a question. That's an issue that is going to be sort of coming up in the next um, sort of 15 minutes, which is 
when we are bringing employees back to work, are we going to do something like temperature checks, medical questionnaires, have you had any symptoms? A lot of people are seeing that when they go into uh, the, maybe not the grocery store, but a personal services to get their, you know, their hair cut or to go to the gym. There's going to be a questionnaire that says, have you had any of these symptoms or exposed or a rash or fever? That, that's separate. What I'm saying is in terms of identifying people who may be eligible for an accommodation is sort of uh, uh, high risk factors and, and, and raise your hand if you don't feel comfortable coming back to work because you fall into one of the high risk factors. And what we're seeing a lot of is employers, as Brett said, as Carolyn said, and as I said, is we're seeing employers who just, they just feel like I'm just gonna make it easy for the person who's over 65, for the person who has um, had asthma or uh, you know, other um, medical issues and I'm not gonna bring them back. And, and that's really the danger is sort of making that paternalistic um, conclusion for them because there's an awful lot of it, particularly in Colorado, also in, you know, in California and every state in between, there's a lot of 65 and 70 year olds who can sort of beat me down the ski hill. And if you sort of take the position that, hey, you're in that high risk category, I don't wanna be responsible for you. I'm not bringing you back to work. And I'm bringing back the 35 year old who was like, okay, I'm ready to go, but who made a, you know, might, might have partied hard and be, been exposed to COVID. You're making a lot of assumptions on those two employees that are absolutely wrong. Um, and, and that's where the danger comes. Carolyn, Brett, any other thoughts in terms of uh, some of the categories that clearly, if this individual has reluctance to come back, they, they, they're not coming back versus some categories that might be harder calls? Yeah, so let me, let me jump in and talk about um, one of the harder call circumstances that I've seen recently, and that is an employer um, that really does need to have individuals at work to do the job effectively, so essentially, let's call it the sales function, and this employer hasn't really uh, gotten all of their sales information online, and it's still really in paper format, and to be effective, somebody needs to be at the job. Um, and specifically at the workplace to, to get the job done properly. And you have somebody who um, is not in one of the high risk categories, um, who the employer in the past has had a problem with the individual um, not putting forth full effort. Um, the employer suspects what's happening with the individual working at home is they're essentially paying um, for somebody to work who's not really doing much by way of work. And, and can you say to that individual, look, you just need to come back to work. Um, and if you don't come back to work, there's going to be consequences. Um, the reason why I see that as sort of a harder category is that, you know, you're kind of up against um, an employer's right to be able to give directions to employees and say, no, you're going to do what I tell you to do because I'm the employer and you follow my instructions. And then on the other side of this, you have, um, you know, a, a time in our history that is sort of unprecedented where um, people have legitimate concerns. There are those individuals who, who are legitimately concerned about contracted, co contracting COVID-19 and the fear that you are creating the appearance of being insensitive um, by coming down hard on an individual who says they don't want to come back to work. Um, you know, that can create internal morale problems when that individual communicates to other employees um, that you're being heavy handed and, and firing somebody under those circumstances, um, even though they may not be in a protected class, I wouldn't put it out of the possibilities that somebody might be able to try to gin up um, an employment claim. And I'm not sure you want to be the employer who kick somebody to the curb who says they don't want to come back. And so what we've been trying to do is explore other options um, like a furlough, an unpaid furlough, where you're not actually terminating somebody's employment. You're saying, hey, look, here's all the steps we've taken to make the workplace safe. If you don't want to come in and you're not comfortable, um, we'll go in a different direction, but that's going to, you know, and we're not going to terminate your employment, but that is going to result in you being in a furloughed status. Um, it, it's the, these are difficult issues and we haven't had to deal with them before. And, you know, my guiding um, principle on this always is to sort of take a step back and apply that reasonable business test um, so that it doesn't look like you're being too heavy handed because, you know, I, I think we, we have started to see some of the law lawsuits flowing from COVID-19 and I think that's going to continue. 
Um, you just want to make sure that when your corporate representative is being deposed, they can say with a straight face, this is why we did what we did. Um, one final issue before we turn to uh, Carolyn for the third part of today's panel. Um, a possible mitigation measure to employer liability, you could conceive of different types of waivers. That an employee would say, I understand the risk and I agree that I won't pursue uh, an action in tort, for example. Um, maybe let's give the Colorado perspective about whether that is advisable first from Amy uh, or Brett. And then Carolyn, I know that California is a little bit different on that. Um, Amy, Brett, any thoughts about use of a waiver and whether that's advisable? Brett, take that one. <laughs> All right, fair, fair enough. Um, so I, so it, it, it sort of flows from the, the negligence concept. So, you know, the reality in Colorado is that those waivers, sort of advanced waivers, are a little bit like what you sign when you want to when you want to get your ski pass, um, and and it is sort of an acknowledgement that look, the ski area is a dangerous place to be, and we can't predict all of the ways in which you might get hurt. Um, but to have um, the privilege of being able to come and, and ski at the ski area, um, you're going to have to sign this acknowledgement and, and kind of advance waiver. The reason why those are a little complicated is that the law recognizes that um, there's always an issue with waiving a future claim, something in the future you don't know about now, um, and there's a question about whether it's really a knowing and volunteering waiver if you're not sure exactly what you're waiving. Um, that being said, um, those types of documents um, are, are relatively common. I have to sign one every time I want to get my ski pass. Um, Any time that you're ever doing uh, something that is, is dangerous, whether it's rafting or whatever, you sign a waiver like that. And they do stick um, in some situations against some types of cases. I have had um, some of my clients, I would say it's very much in the minority, uh, who've asked for assistance in drafting a waiver like that. As much as anything, it's kind of a notice, it's more of an assumption of risk document where you, you, you know what the, the potential risks are. I'm putting you on notice um, that there are dangers in the workplace. Um, and I just want to make sure that you understand before you come in that, you know, it's possible you could contract COVID-19, you might get sick, etc. Um, so those documents, you know, can be drafted. I wouldn't hazard a guess on how enforceable they're going to be. It's certainly not going to be a waiver of workers' comp liability. That's its own structure and, and regime that, that requires a specific document and release. Um, you know, there are some of my clients who feel like they would rather um, have it and not need it than need it and not have it. And so they're going ahead and putting those in place, recognizing there might be enforceability issues at the outset. My feeling is, you know, we can draft those up. I have been drafting those up, but you kind of have to go in with your eyes wide open. That is not going to be uh, Kevlar that's going to prevent you from, you know, from a lawsuit later on. It, it could still be held to be unenforceable in Colorado. Very helpful. Carolyn, maybe um, a brief word about how that's cashing out in Cal or how that cashes out under California law. And then we'd love to have you turn to the third part in terms of workplace testing, health considerations, and privacy. Yeah. So in California, waiver would probably be void as against public policy. It, it, it's a little different than buying a ski ticket because here you have an employer who has a lot of power and an employee who generally doesn't. Um, so I'm not sure that would pass muster in California. And in California, we have this sort of an added complication in that there is a labor code section that makes it unlawful to have an employee sign something that might be unlawful. So you have to really be careful in California and, you know, maybe in Colorado, you might be able to kind of throw it out there and see if it sticks in California. You know, if it is an unlawful document, you're having someone sign that could be its own violation, its own separate violation. Um, so let me just now turn to uh, the, the next part of this, which is talking about the um, health, I'm going to talk about health screening and privacy and essentially, you know, what we do, what employers should be doing when employees are confirmed to have COVID. And I'll just race through this because it's a 
ton of information. But uh, many jurisdictions are requiring daily health screenings, and we've already uh, touched on that a little bit. Um, and the screenings are required often before employees enter the workplace each day. And they can figuring out how to do these daily screenings can be a really important part of an employer's overall return to work plan. Um, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission fortunately released guidance indicating that employers are permitted to ask questions about COVID-19 symptoms um, or have an employee provide a certification regarding symptoms and employers can do this on a daily basis or some other interval but of course you have to look to the particular guidelines and orders that, that govern the jurisdiction. Uh, the EEOC also has given the green light to temperature checks um, as well as more recently to um, COVID-19 testing which I'll turn to in a minute. So one consideration is where do you do the screening? Um, if you do it at work, that can raise some privacy considerations. It can you need to figure out like who's gonna be doing it and what personal protective equipment do you have to give the person who's conducting um, the, the screenings. Um, you can have employees do self screens at home, but this can be um, potentially difficult to enforce. Um, and also how will you screen? You can ask the employee um, questions about their symptoms. Um, you can have them perhaps fill out a questionnaire. Uh, some employers, actually quite a few employers are looking into the use of apps or online symptoms or symptom checkers uh, that give employees like a red light or a green light. Red light meaning you've got something, you've got a symptom or you've been exposed and you should not be coming to work. Green light means good, you're good to go. Um, with regard to temperature checks, there are some best practices. If they're done on site, you want to provide a private space for the checks. If you can, um, use no contact thermometers or thermal scanners. Um, ensure that there's social distancing while people wait in line to have their temperatures taken. Um, there's a little bit of controversy over temperature checks in the first place because they only tell you in the moment if someone might have COVID. Um, there are many reasons for elevated temperatures. Each person's different. A normal temperature at one moment could be um, you know, a, a over 100.4 an hour later. Um, for all types of screening measures, employers need to provide notice to employees of the measures that they're going to be um, undertaking and ensure that they're following EEOC guidance, which is very clear regarding the confidentiality um, of, with regard to the collection and the storage of medical information. So even something like an employee's temp, the, the, a particular temperature, um, that would be um, protected medical information. It would have to be kept confidential in a separate medical file. Um, and it's also important to note that these broad rules with regard to um, collection of information in this COVID pandemic, these are special pandemic rules. So what you can ask about medical conditions or symptoms or what kinds of medical tests employers can require, it's much more restricted um, in non-pandemic times. So employers are going to have to really pay attention um, to sort of when things will sort of shift. So let me turn to testing. Um, so some employers may choose to provide um, or require COVID-19 diagnostic testing for employees and we're really just seeing this get off the ground now as testing is expanding and it's become more becoming more widely available. Um, there are currently two, two sort of broad categories of tests. There are the diagnostic tests and the antibody or serology tests. The diagnostic tests are the tests that can tell you someone has COVID now, they've got the virus in their body. The antibody or serology tests can tell you, so I think some of them um, can tell you if you're sort of closer to the tail end and developing antibodies and they can also potentially tell you if you've had it. Uh, last month the EEOC released guidance authorizing employers to administer COVID tests to employees before permitting employees to enter the workplace. Um, although the agency also cautioned that employers need to or have a responsibility to make sure that the tests that they're using are accurate. Um, the EEOC guidance specifically focused on an authorized um, diagnostic testing. They did not mention serology testing. So for now, um, we're assuming that serology tests are, um, we don't know if, if they're um, specifically permitted um, by employers, um, but we anticipate and are hoping that the EOC will be issuing some guidance on that in the near future. Um, but in any event, you know, there's a lot of caveats about testing. Um, 
with diagnostic tests, there's a lot of false negatives. Uh, so you have to be careful with that. With serology or antibody tests, um, I understand there are a lot of false positives. And we hear, um, we hear a lot about immunity passports um, and you know, the concept that people who've had COVID and if you have, you have the antibodies that maybe you can get some sort of immunity passport, but because of um, the reliability or lack of reliability around these tests, we're really not there yet. Um, so related issues to this is like, what if an employee refuses to be screened or tested? Maybe one, we can go into this more in the discussion, but I'll just touch on it. But um, again, it's an area where an employer really needs to examine the reason for that. Is it medical? Is there a, a, a need or a way to accommodate the employee uh, with some extra safety precautions? Does the employee um, need to stay home or is it just that the employees, uh, it also could be a religious reason um, that need, might need to be accommodated. Um, but the accommodation, depending upon um, you know, what the risks are could be that the person um, might need to go on leave for a while. Um, just, it depends on, depends on the particular risks. Um, so let me delve into privacy issues associated with the various screening methods. Um, uh, first of all, it's important um, to make sure that any screening measures are really focused on COVID-19 and COVID-19 symptoms. Employers shouldn't be looking into um, other potential medical conditions, um, even if those may, can put somebody at higher risk, um, as um, both Amy and Brett were talking about, um, unless an employee requests an accommodation. And any medical information that's collected during the screening or testing um, or in an accommodation process has to be kept in a file separate from the employee's medical file. The files have to remain confidential. Um, and I think I mentioned that even an employee's temperature um, could be considered or would be considered confidential medical information. Um, under the uh, Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, I think I've got the right name there, HIPAA, um, employers shouldn't attempt to obtain medical information from um, the employee's health plan or covered uh, healthcare provider unless they have the employee's consent or authorization. Um, there could also be other privacy obligations that might be jurisdiction specific, such as to formally notify employees as to what information will be collected um, under the California Consumer Privacy Act. And it's also, I think, just a good practice to notify employees to what you're going to be doing. Um, and then last, let me turn to um, COVID exposure. So, you know, inevitably, once we all return to the workplace, um, and despite all the pre-screening measures, some employees are going to be getting sick and they're gonna be potentially exposing others in the workplace, and how should employers be dealing with that? Um, and, you know, we've seen a lot of this in the news already with you know, some, um, essential employers that have been up and running and running into to, um, issues where employees are coming to work sick and exposing others, or coming to work um, asymptomatic, but with COVID and exposing other people. Um, it's really important to have clear procedures in place um, to deal with the exposure before it happens um, and really being um, certain to continually adapt the procedures as needed um, to respond to changes in the science, changes in the guidelines. Um, I think it was Amy who mentioned, I mean, we're really uh, seeing changes some, some days like on an hourly basis. So it's really important to keep up on that. Um, make the employer needs to determine how to identify and isolate um, someone with the with COVID symptoms um, or who has tested positive for it if, if need be if the person's at, at the workplace um, seek medical attention for them um, make sure that there are guidelines guidelines in place to um, keep the identity of that person uh, confidential that's critical um, develop plans also to identify who the um, infected employee came into contact with and how you're going to inform those individuals we refer to as close contacts um, and how you would even define who a close contact is um, as well as how you're going to inform the broader workplace maybe you know not the people who are close contacts but the people who work in the same building um, and any third parties who may have been at the workplace at the same time like contractors or vendors or, or customers um, you need to have plans in place for disinfecting and cleaning um, once there's been a report of an illness. And then um, you also need to have uh, return to work protocol. 
um, to make sure that employees don't return to work too soon and that CDC and state and local guidelines um, are being followed. And they, again, these are areas where like they can vary. So you really need to make sure that you're looking to the strictest standard. And then just one last point, just, um, and I'll, I'll turn it back to you, Brad. Um, on contact tracing, there are lots of options on the market for employers to um, monitor um, employees in the workplace to monitor their movements so that they can better manage potential COVID-19 exposure and have the data about who's been near whom and um, whether they might have been exposed. And as, you know, back onto the privacy point, these, um, these technologies can potentially be very useful, but they also carry workplace privacy implications. So it's important to really assess the technology, um, what data it's collecting, who's getting the data, um, what form of employee notice and consent would be required, um, those types of things. All right, that is such an informative framework. Thank you for that, Carolyn. I'm gonna um, pick up two questions related to that. And then we'll turn to Q&A from those who are on the Zoom. So please go ahead. I, I think I mistakenly said use the chat function for questions. Please put them in the Q&A uh, as we go forward. And we'll pick up those questions beginning after uh, a few minutes here. Uh, the first is, um, let's take up the, the fundamental tension of the ability to promote safety by informing other people in the workplace that a colleague has become sick with the virus, as that runs up against potential uh, confidentiality and privacy concerns that we might not say Jack by name, but Jack sits next to these three people and inevitably we're gonna be able to triangulate, so to speak, and figure out, well, it must've been Jack, we haven't seen him this week. Um, any thoughts about how is an employer gonna go about balancing the interests of confidentiality of someone who is sick versus the rights of others to be informed that someone's got uh, become sick. Um, Amy, Brett, you guys want to take a first swing at that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, part of it is, and I don't want, I don't mean to be flippant, part, part of it is the optics of the employer making the best effort. So obviously, um, if the employer takes all the steps that he or she can to maintain the privacy of the individual, we're not shouting it from the rooftops, hey, you know, Joe has COVID and anybody who's been in contact with Joe, that we're doing it very discreetly. We're asking Joe for the list of names that he came in contact with. And I think the standard is for a prolonged period of time. So you sort of, you know, walk by somebody in the hallway, they don't necessarily need to be on the list. It's, it, there, there are gradations. If we have employees who say, um, well, I have the right to know, and um, you know, I might bring this home to my family. It's it's diffusing that and sort of asking, you know, these employees, put yourself into Joe's shoes. This is, you know, it is a medical issue. It's a personnel issue. We can't disclose that information. I'm not going to sort of confirm or deny that it's Joe. Just, you know, we're going to tell you what we're doing in the workplace to make you safe. And and again, we try and sort of have, you know tamp down the gossip. We, we can't eliminate it completely. Uh, people are going to talk and they're going to try and guess. And, and we as an employer are going to do what we can to sort of minimize that and, and sort of focus on the health and, and, and safety. A uh, quick follow up. What if the individual who gets sick will stay with the name Joe? <laughs> says, uh, I got the virus. Everybody needs to know. You can tell people it's me. Brett? Yeah, so my response is... <laughs> <laughs> Make sure everybody Amy, gets a turn. <laughs> yeah, a Amy's developing a habit of deferring to me. Um, yeah, so, you know, my reaction to that is that con consent is a great thing in, in terms of most types of claims that get uh, asserted. And I have had situations before where um, an individual who you know, was infected, wanted to put coworkers at ease so that they wouldn't be wondering who and where and how, um, and specifically said, um, look, I, I, I want to be the one to communicate the message. And, and I've had other situations where I've had uh, employees say, it's fine that you can communicate the message. You know, most privacy claims um, kind of go away once the individual gives permission to disclose that information, it's up to them. 
to be a little, you know, conservative and sound too much like a lawyer, I, I would want to have that confirmed in writing. If the individual wants to send out that message, that's fine. I would try to um, be a little careful that you're not sort of fanning the flames of panic and get everybody in uproar. And so work with the employee in terms of what the messaging is going to be and how it's going to be communicated. I'm, I'm fine with that going out. I just, I, I always want to be mindful of kind of the law of unintended consequences of what's the best way for this to be communicated. And then just from the employer standpoint, making sure that you've got that permission confirmed in writing. I don't think I would let the employee send out their own messaging. Not, not I, I would just definitely disagree. Yeah. So I would definitely say like, you're not going to you're not sending out an email, like an all hands email, like, like great that you want us to know. And, Here's, here's confirmation that you've, you're allowing us, the employer, to share that information. But um, I would try and control the, the messaging. Well, thanks for taking on that difficult question. I'm going to go to some of the Q&A from others on the Zoom. The first relates to, uh, I think, a general question about who is asking their employees physically to return. Um, I, I guess what comes to mind is someone who's working in a factory, which may not have ever stopped, store, office. Um, are, are there categories where you're seeing uh, your clients um, in general, these are who is being asked to come back and in these instances, by and large, it's work from home right now, Carolyn? Um, yeah, uh, you know, we're seeing a lot of different types of industries and employers um, at at least thinking about it now. Um, in terms of employers that are sort of really taking action and kind of moving ahead, um, I would say employers, you know, in the entertainment industry are chomping at the bit. And the second, for example, in California that they give the, the, the green light, which will be um, any day now, that's gonna, uh, that industry will be back online, I think very quickly, different, but, but quickly. Um, I think uh, we're seeing, we are seeing um, employers that have salespeople and that need to go out and make um, sort of in-person sales calls, um, thinking about um, getting people back in jurisdictions that are, you know, more widely open, not so much California, but um, some of the other jurisdictions. Um, and, uh, you know, I think a lot of employers with offices uh, that are office-based are um, thinking about how to bring people back. We also have, uh, and, and maybe not their entire workforce, but at least making it voluntary for, for some time to come back. Um, and, um, you know, we, there are also um, many kinds of employers from, you know, could be a biotech lab, it could be, um, you know, small, you know, uh, manufacturer of some high-tech equipment, whatever it is, you know, they have employees maybe who have been, haven't been working because um, they can't telecommute. So they're looking to bring those workforces back. So it's pretty broad. Super helpful. We've got another question. I'm gonna um, give it a, maybe a little bit of a half turn, which relates to, um, to the extent we've talked about what an employer must do as a legal matter to, uh, as, a, as a legal matter. Um, we've talked about a couple instances in which above and beyond that, an employer might just wanna do the right thing by an employee, um, there, there's uh, larger interests at stake uh, than just what the minimum of the law is. Are there some instances in which you find yourselves telling an, or advising an employer, you know, here's what the law is, but you, you really probably want to think twice before, say, exercising your right as an employer, uh, and you might want to think about doing something different than or above and beyond what the law already requires? I mean... I think that Brett really touched on that, you know, and, and we can amplify it. And, and Carolyn touched on it as well. We all recognize that there is an incredible amount of fear and anxiety um, and generalized fear and anxiety that doesn't fall into any of these categories or protected categories. And I think what, every, what I heard people saying and what I guess I would um, reiterate is in this time of uncertainty, if there is the ability to allow people extra time, you know, unpaid leave, um, to remind them that if they have childcare issues, there, you know, there are um, obligations and there are rights and responsibilities, and we may go above and beyond in allowing people to take more PTO. There are companies that allow people to voluntarily give their paid time off, their vacation time to other employees 
who might have already, you know, sort of tapped out their paid time off and in order to, um, to allow that person to spend more time at home with family um, and sort of understanding that if we put people on furlough who aren't ready to come back to work, that they will stay on the employer's health care benefits, but then they may still be able to apply for unemployment and get that enhanced unemployment. So these are all things that we, um, we recognize, but I will also say that there's so much focus um, in the media about, as I started out in the beginning saying sort of telecommute forever, that it's, it's a disservice to those employers that don't have that option. I mean, the whole economy is built on, you know, restaurants and, and cleaning supply, suppliers and manufacturers and, and people who need to go into a lab and figure out if we can find a cure for um, the virus that to to make the assumption that an employer is being either mean or short-sighted because they won't let people stay home indefinitely sort of does a disservice to the employers that are really grappling with geez I would love to have my employees stay home forever but we 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 we've got to service the economy um, we have about two minutes left, and this has been just a dynamite discussion. Many thanks to each of you. Um, in closing, I'd love to raise this you know, problem that we're all dealing with, but especially for those that are looking at employer-employee issues in the pandemic, which is, it's such a dynamic area. Carolyn alluded to this just a few minutes ago. Uh, regulations and guidance are coming out um, in, in a, at a very furious pace. Um, in terms of staying up on this, are there places or resources that you would recommend, especially if someone is trying to stay abreast of employment law in the land of, uh, of the pandemic? Uh, and feel free to, to tout some of your own materials, but in terms of where should I go next? Brett, any, uh, you have one or two high value suggestions? Yeah, so, so most, the, the first stop, and it doesn't have to be my law firm, but most law firms, uh, many of the larger firms, have sort of a COVID-19 database, resource database, um, that they're making available to clients. Our firm's doing that, and I know a lot of other large firms uh, are doing the same thing. Um, you know, I happen to be signed up on a sort of a database that, that is an employment law database that constantly has articles coming out, and it's, and it's typically the big national firms that... Um, are devoting a lot of resources to making sure that they put that information um, out there, but more specifically that it's right. Um, one of the things that I have learned through this process is that, um, you know, what we think is the answer is uh, a different answer tomorrow. And it's kind of hard, you know, that's the dynamic nature brand that you're talking about. It's kind of hard to keep your arms around it because everything is moving so quickly. Um, you know, my, basic response would be sort of staying on the internet and trying to stay t more towards um, national firms only because those tend to be a good resource and they're devoting a significant amount of time to trying to get the right answer. That would be my best answer. Carolyn, um, briefly. Yeah, so we're one of those national firms. Um, <laughs> and there's, you know, we have the hands on deck to be able to do it. So, you know, we were talking about waivers before and right now, you know, we have a brand new crop of um, summer interns and they are fanned out and they're researching every single state about um, these issues of sort of waivers and negligence. Um, but in terms of, you know, what I would check, um, I would constantly check, I would just Google CDC what's new and you go to the CDC's what's new page, it will tell you um, everything brand new that has come out or anything that's been updated because you can't necessarily tell, like for example, if you go to the CDC, CDC symptoms page, um, they're not dating everything that they release. You can't tell when they've made a change or what the change is. So constantly go to CDC what's new. Um, you can constantly, EEOC has their um, FAQs on um, issues around the pandemic. That's a, another good resource to, to, to check that often. And then, you know, for an employer that is in a particular jurisdiction, I would say, you know, once a day or, you know, every, every couple of days, take a look back through the, you know, in California, the California orders and then the county and then the city where you are to see what's new. You know, there's just constant new industry guidance. Um, the, the shelter in place order might have changed. The, the uh, appendix, the social distancing appendix that you have to fill out and post might have, might have changed. So just kind of, you know, sort of 
keep running a check on those things. That's great. Amy, you get the last word. Anything that you would add to that list? I would just say that for the national firms that Brett mentioned that Carolyn is part of, um, my old law firm, Cypher Shaw, um, all of this information is not just for um, their clients. It's, it's readily available on their website. So just to make sure that people on the call understands that you don't have to be uh, a Covington client or, or a DGS client, or um, that if you start looking for some of the major firms, all of their, they have they have all these checklists and it really is um, a valuable resource um, to, to go to. So I echo what my colleague said. All right, well, um, such a stimulating discussion. You guys really provided a, a tractable framework for thinking about many of the hard issues that companies and employees are going to be working through uh, in the coming months and perhaps a uh, year plus yet. We'll, we'll see how long, but uh, many thank yous, Carolyn, Brett, and Amy. Uh, I will give you guys the applause and you can hear other on the call applauding as well. Um, many thank yous. And again, thanks to the Silicon Flatirons team. Thank you everyone for joining today. Great. Thank, thank you. you.